So uh, what I want to do today is talk, uh, as Michael said, about work that I've been doing for uh, the last decade or so on personalizing the search experience. And I want to do that by highlighting both the tremendous opportunities, and I think the, the need to do so, but also to talk about some of the, the challenges that, uh, that happen when you think about personalization. So I want to start by providing um, an overview of perspectives on personalization by thinking about how Michael, Michael alluded to this, search happens not in isolation, but in a broader context. And so I'll talk some about that. I'll talk about a uh, framework that we developed to understand the potential for improving systems by personalizing them. And then I'll give as many examples as we have time for. And I'll spend the last 10 minutes or so uh, thinking about challenges and, and new directions. So let's start with the perspectives. So uh, oh, actually, before I do that, what I want to do is really highlight why I'm excited about this, this area and why it's increasingly important. So about 20 years ago, um, the first graphical browsers were introduced. These were early web search engines, so InfoSeq, Lycos. You notice that Google is not there yet. Uh, here's the online presence that some institutions had. So this is Stanford's computer science homepage updated 8th of May, 1997 by WPB, whoever that might be. You don't see that on modern search engines. Uh, New Times Roman font. Here's the human computer interaction seminar that I guess I'm giving today. One of the interesting things, if you have really good eyes, is that James Landay from Berkeley spoke uh, February 12th, 1999. <laughs> so I'm following you by 21 years, I guess. Um, the, ch the page actually hasn't changed that much. This bar has moved to the top. And the goofy three dimension, the other, other pages on the web have changed a lot more. This is Microsoft's researches homepage in 1997. It too was uh, New Times Roman. It had a search button and some really interesting nav features. The size of the web around this time was about 3,000 sites. The size of Lycos, one of the earliest web search engines, when it debuted was 54,000 pages. Right. Th that number of search engines, that, that number of sites is probably uh, added every minute or so these days. Furthermore, they indexed only the first 128K of a document because they were worried about copyright of uh, web content. It also had this super cool, interesting link that I remember using called the top 5% of sites in the world. So you could look at what the top 5% were. Imagine doing that now. Um, the other interesting thing is that there was very, very limited user interaction data. So there were about 1,500 queries a day. And that's partly because a lot of search at that point happened um, on the, the client. Things like a search for help in, in Office or in other systems was all client side. And the revolution of increasing the size of the web, increasing the number of pages indexed by web search engines, and most importantly, by having this feedback loop of what it is that people do have, have changed just tremendously. So today, we have billions of websites. Uh, trillions of web pages are indexed by modern search engines. There are tri trillions of web searches and clicks per day. Perhaps the, the most important thing, I think, is that search has gone, grown from being kind of an esoteric skill that you needed two years in graduate library school or maybe a master's degree in computer science to, to master to something that absolutely everybody uses every day. Um, and they use it. How many people have searched today on, on the web? <laughs> How many of you have spent your lifetime with web search engines? <laughs> Okay. So there's some people at the back who have never lived without a web search engine. Certainly my grandchildren don't know what it's like to go to a, a library to look things up. They expect this information to be there 24-7. It's used for everything from finding information to tr planning travel for things like important things like health, um, information, troubleshooting, and, and so on. So it's gone from being something that was very, very um, esoteric to something that people depend on every day for more and more um, information. It's also pervasive. I'm going to talk today about web search, since I've done a lot of work in that area. But you, there's search everywhere. It's on the desktop. It's within apps. It's in enterprise and, and so on. And I think one of the things, if I have time at the end, that would be fun to talk about is how more and more I think we need to provide people access not just to search on the web, but to the many ways in which and places where we interact with information. 
And I think because of the pervasiveness of search systems, it's more important now than ever to think and about how people interact with systems, what they want to do that they can't do, and to support them in doing that. And I think personalization is a key part of that, that story. So when you think about um, web search, you often think about a query, 2.3 words on, on average. Something happens in the black box, and then results magically appear. Right? That's how an information retrieval person often thinks about search, and they worry a lot about what's in that black box. What I want to talk about today is the fact that search doesn't occur in isolation. It, the, these queries don't drop from the sky into a search box. They're issued by real life human beings with an information need. The, the documents, the content on the web is not unrelated. It's related very richly by what site it appears on, by cross links, by co-interaction patterns that, that people have in navigating the web. Um, and you know, perhaps most importantly is, by and large, people don't search to have fun. They don't search for kicks. Right? Like I, I love search. I've been doing it for almost 40 years now. And I don't get up in the morning and say, hey, I think I'll search for kicks. I do it because I'm looking for information, because I want to satisfy some need. It could be a vague one, like I want to catch up on the news. But I don't do it just to, to have fun. And the more we understand um, where the search queries are coming from, what the rich and interrelated structure of web pages are, and most importantly, what tasks people have, the better job we can do in satisfying people's information needs. And so what I, I want to talk about is the fact today that um, if, as a web search provider, you have a single ranking for every person at every point in time, you're going to do that fundamental, fundamentally limits the quality of that search experience. Okay, and um, the, what I will describe in a minute is how we can quantify the variability that different people have when they issue the same query. So how many people looked up news today? Okay, what site did you go to? CNN. New York Times app. The person with the New York Yankees jacket. What did you look? <laughs> You didn't look at news. OK. One, there was a person over there. What did you look at? OK. Anyway, we'll do one more. You're smiling. Oh, uh, I guess Fox News. <laughs> so people had the same inf information need at some level to find out about. And you went to very different sites. So it, oh, how's a web search engine to respond to that? And what I'm going to do is try to quantify how different people have different intents and how you can discover those. And I'll do that through this, this technique called the potential for per personalization. So on the x-axis here, imagine you have uh, a number of different users. In this case, it goes up to only six. And on the y-axis, you have some measure of the quality of the search experience. In this case, it's NDCG, Normalized Discounted Cumulative Gain. And what that means is you basically uh, measure the performance of a system by high, how high up in the rank it gets the right information. Um, OK, so if I personalized, if the systems were personalized to you as individuals, we'd have a 100% uh, score. The more I add multiple people whose information needs I need to satisfy at the same time, we saw three people here looking for news, and they had three different sites to go to. The more that a single ranking is going to decrease in performance. And this gap is what I call the potential for personalization. You can close this pretty big gap um, by not improving the core ranking algorithm necessarily, but by try to understand a little bit about the context in which that query is being asked. Um, there are different ways to measure what individuals want. You can do like I did, ask people. That's an explicit judgment. You can measure it by what people do. So if you issue a query and click on the same site over and over and over again, any search engine that doesn't learn that is, is stupid. Um, you can do it through content analysis. There are a variety of ways of doing it. And the, we did some studies where we did explicit judgments for a large number of queries. Uh, and what we found is that you can get 46% improvement. So this is the, the ranking, we'll say, of modern web search engines. This is what you get if you personalize, I mean, if you individualize. There's a 46% uh, improvement that you can get here. 
And there's another 24% if all you do is personalize with whatever current ranking system is. So there are fundamental limits as to how high this can go. It's never going to go beyond the variability in what people mean for, different people mean for the same query. OK, so not all, high, all queries have a high potential for personalization. New York Times, if people type in the query New York Times, 98% of the time they go to one page, nytimes.com. On the other hand, a query like Kai can mean Chi Chi Rodriguez. It can mean the Computer Human Interaction Conference. It can mean Tai Chi. It can mean lots of things. And so here's a, a, actually a fun query where you look at maps. The first one is Bing Maps. Almost everybody goes to the same site if they issue that query. Google Maps, similarly. If you get to Texas County Maps, there's more variability in what people click on. If you go to Street Maps, there's even more variability. So different queries vary in the amount that you can improve them um, by, through personalization. And so in a lot of this work, we learn models about uh, how to personalize. So let me, this is a, I, I gave part of the, this talk at Chris Manning's IR course uh, a year or so ago. And so what's the potential for personalization for the query Stanford IR course? High, high-ish, low-ish? No. Low? Okay. It also means Stanford Program for International Relations. Chris's book, it means also Stanford Interventional Radiology. Uh, all of whom offer courses. There's a not, it's also a part of the catalog. So there is actually a fair amount of, of personalization. That's so do we only think about personalization as going to a different site or also within the site itself? And, uh, both of those. I'm two different page. So these are clearly high level, different in, intents. But even if we agree that it's Stanford information retrieval course, Chris Manning's course, there are lots of things that people do. They might want to go to uh, the course policies, to the schedule, to a calendar, to some Piazza. Does that still e exist? To um, other things about when homework is due. So given the same intent, I mean, you can think of the first kind of difference is extrinsic diversity, so things that we are, are different targets. But even if you know what the intent is at a high level, there are lots of different things that people want to do within that, that site. Um, and then again, we talked about how you can identify the interests. How, how would you identify people's different interests? <laughs> how would you identify people's interests? Sure, you, I was looking behind you, but we'll, we'll go there next. We'll go there next. <laughs> go for it. So, so, I don't know, it would be based on the prior you know, things that they were doing or okay. the prior things that they were saying or talking or something. Okay. Uh, maybe stuff that their friends searched for or okay. timely relevance. Uh -huh. Location. Location. These are all things that will appear soon. So uh, there are lots of things you could do, right? You could look at past behaviors. Even in the current session, you could look at longer history of interaction um, and, and preferences. You could also look at contextual metadata, location, time, uh, what device you're on. All of those things are going to matter in terms of what's relevant for a particular query. And in doing all of this, we need to build a model of a person and you can do that by looking at a variety of sources of evidence. You can look at behavior. You can look at content of pages that they visit. You can look at um, context, this broader uh, contextual metadata. You can look at this over a short period of time. You can integrate over just what's going on in this hour course. You can look at much longer term patterns of behavior. And you can end up, I'll talk about this as personalization. But it really might be better talked about as contextualization. So it, I mean, it, I can mean an individual. I can mean everybody in this class. I can mean everybody who attends Stanford, everybody who's in a particular location at a particular time. So there's a variety of contexts that's useful to take into account. And then how do you use the models? And where do they reside? So they could reside on the client. They could reside on a server. They could be used for ranking. They could be used to suggest queries. They could be used for a presentation. Um, and then the question is, when do you use it? Do you use it for every search query, some of them? Uh, do you learn when to use it? And what I'm going to do today, so these are all choices that you need to make in delivering a service that's personalized. And I'm going to give you four examples that kind of span the space of the very, very rich design space that, that's shown here. 
So one um, is a very simple system that Michael uh, mentioned earlier, uh, did both at, uh, at Yahoo when she was an intern and at Microsoft, called personal navigation. And that system takes as a model of a person's interests, only their pe previous queries and the pages they clicked. So a pretty simple model. It's long term. It looks at people over a year or more. It's done at the individual level. The model in this case resided on the server, and it was used to sometimes influence ranking. Okay. Um, I also worked on a system called personalized search, which had a much richer model of a person's interest. It was everything that was on their desktop machine at the time. Now you might think of it as every uh, page you've encountered in a browser or an app. So tremendously broad perspective, um, long-term, again, individual. Here the model resided on the client. Right, so, um, and it was used both for ranking and presentation. And we used it either all times or always or sometimes. And then in the last example I'm going to talk about, we built a system that used both short and long-term context. A uh, pretty wide variety of things, mostly web content. Um, and it was done both at the individual and group level. So this is a much broader notion of representation of my interests, both in terms of the current acute needs as well as longer term preferences. Um, and it was used in uh, ranking, and we learned when to use it. OK, so let me start on, on these. I'll get through as many of these as I have time for. And so let me start with the personal navigation. So when we think of web search, you think about people discovering new information. But in fact, a lot of what people do on the web is to go back to sites they've seen before. Um, so did you, have you looked on the web today? Yes, uh, what was the last, the, la the last site you went to, had you been there before? Uh, or was it new site? Yeah, yesterday. Okay, you've been there yesterday. Okay, Michael, what was the last site you looked at and had you looked at it before? Your bio. <laughs> <laughs> Not recently. Okay. <laughs> uh, somebody else? Uh, yeah, it's Spanish dictionary. And had you looked at a Spanish dictionary before? Every day for a couple of weeks. <laughs> okay, you must be taking a, a Spanish class. <laughs> okay, so a lot of the things that people look for, you've looked for before. A a lot of the things you've clicked on, you've clicked on before. And a large proportion of these are things um, in the square that says repeated queries and repeated clicks. These are essentially navigational queries where you take a query like New York Times and you always go to the same site. Okay. These are consistent intents across individuals. And you can identify these, these kinds of navigational intents. So people go a lot not just to understand, or find new information, but to get to places, this notion of navigation, which was completely unexpected when people built the first search engines. They expected to, people to do library searches, and they're using search a lot to get someplace rather than to, to find information. These, can be, these kinds of navigational queries can be identified in lots of ways. They have a pretty consistent click behavior, and they also have anchor text. Do folks know what anchor text is? It's links that point into a page. There is very little variability in how people address what they're pointing to for navigational queries. So for New York Times, it might be New York Times or NY Times. Much less variability than, than uh, what you see in web page content. There's also a notion called personal navigation queries. So these are queries where you might have different intents across individuals, but they're consistent within an individual. So for me, Michael talked about my work in, in Kai, but I also do a lot of work in information retrieval. So if I type, and I was chair of the SIGIR uh, ACM group. So if I type in SIGIR, I want to go to www.sigir.com, right? And in the Bing rankings at the time, it was not all that highly ranked. <laughs> this other guy named Stuart, Stuart Bowen Jr., he was the special inspector general for Iraq reconstruction, also abbreviated SIGIR, and he would go to a very different page. But when either one of us asked the query, we probably went to very consistent sites. So this is a notion where the intent is, varies across individuals, but within an individual, it's very consistent. And so um, there were a number of experiments done to, first of all, identify the potential here. And this was done through large-scale log analyses. 
And what you can see is that there is um, actually tr trivial algorithm, like 10 lines of code that will tell you when something looks like a personal navigation query. It's when a person issues a query, clicks on one and only one result. If they do that twice in a row, the chances that they do it a third time are something like 97%. Okay, so this turns out, and furthermore, it covers a large proportion of queries. So 12% of the queries on the web at the time we looked at this were these kinds of personal navigation queries. And the pr prediction accuracy overall was 95%. And so when, in working with Bing in the early days, this was the kind of high coverage and low risk personalization that they were willing to try. Early on, they were totally freaked out about trying to personalize web search results. Um, and then, all that work was done to try to identify the potential using large-scale log analyses. And then the way that we evaluate anything in, um, and I think most people who run large-scale web services do, is through A-B tests, or controlled experimental tests. And those confirm the, the benefits of what we had seen in the logs. That doesn't always happen, <laughs> um, but in, in this case it did. OK, any questions on that? I'm going to switch to personalized search. So this, as I, I mentioned earlier, is um, a much richer model of a person's interest. It was based on previous interaction history across a variety of services and, and apps. And it, the model resided on the client. A query was sent to a web service. More than 10 results were returned. And we did all the re-ranking on the client. Okay, So something like this happens. I type in Kai 2020 goes to Bing, you get some results back. You then assess each of those results relative to my own model of what I'm interested in. Right, so you can, that one's good, that one's good, next one's not so good. And then you re-rank the results based on this client-side model. Okay, so pretty straightforward and, and simple. Um, this has great privacy constraints, I mean privacy characteristics, because the, I only send a standard web query. But what it lacks is something that I think you mentioned earlier. What do my friends do? How do other people who behave like me in this or behave or in the same context as I am? And so it, it has limited portability. It doesn't work if I move to a different machine. And it doesn't take advantage of the interactions of many people who are related to, to me. Um, OK, so how did this work? Um, this is probably more detail than is, is relevant. Uh, but a personalized ranking consisted of two components, a weighted average of the standard web ranking, and then a personalized search result, a uh, personalized score. And that personalized score was based both on the content. We essentially took the log odds of a word appearing in my collection versus the web as a whole. Um, and we had looked at previous interaction with that particular URL or a back off to a site level. So in both of these measure the deviation, essentially, of me versus uh, the rest of the world in interacting with the search results. We did a bunch of offline experiments using explicit judgments. These are sort of painful to get. But we also did um, an in situ evaluation where we deployed this prototype to about over 220 people for several months. And what we did here was we presented a kind of bifurcated list. So here were regular search results. And on the top were two to three personalized results. Okay? And we just looked at how people interacted with those. Um, what we found was that the click-through rate was 28% higher for personalized results. And if you looked at, so you, if you looked at um, the strength of the evidence, if you use only cases where you had a fair amount of evidence, you get about 75% higher click-through rate, which is really pretty good. And so what we did is learned a model for when to personalize. We personalize when we're really confident and not for every query. And so 75% you know, increase in click-through rate based on moving those results to, to the top of the list was, was really quite impressive. And you see a lot of this um, now in, in web search systems. OK. I'm going to switch gears again. I'm, I'm going to do two slides on each of these five or six uh, different topics. And then we can talk more broadly about some of the similarities and differences. Um, so this work was done by looking not just at long-term histories of interaction, but what happens when you have acute information needs? What happens during the course of a session? And we looked both at uh, language models and, and topic models. We also looked, again, at behaviors, specific queries, URL clicks. It turns out that um, 
about 60% of search sessions have multiple queries. And so you have an opportunity when a search extends over a period of time, not at looking not just at my long-term preferences, but what I've done really right now that can give you some insights about what it is I'm doing. And um, so here's examples of how you can use just the previous query. So if I, you know, we type in SIGIR, given the previous query was information retrieval or um, Iraq reconstruction, that gives you some signal of how to interpret this ambiguous query. I showed you the other example of the Stanford IR uh, course. It can either be CS276, which uh, Chris teaches in this very room, I think, mm -hmm. um, international relations, or uh, interventional radiology. Okay. Ego, given id, psychological construct, given El Dorado Gold Corporation, it's, it's stock ticker, and give, given dangerously in love. What does that mean? What's the relationship between dangerously in love and ego? Anybody know? They're Beyonce songs, okay? <laughs> okay. But that, if, if you saw Dangerously in Love and then Ego as a search engine, you probably shouldn't return stock tickers or psychological stuff. <laughs> did you have a question? Okay. Um, and then what we did is we built a personalized model that combined both long-term persistent interests as well as shorter-term acute information needs. And we did this combination using a variety of, of techniques where we looked just at historical data, just at current data, or some aggregation of, of those two. And so here's what we found. If you use just session level data, you get about 25% improvement over standard ranking with no personalization. If you use historic data only, you get about 45%. And then if you combine those, you get a benefit that's 65 to 70 percent better than the standard rankings, given depending on how you combine the, the two. There is really interesting things that happen within a session. So the first query in a session can only use historical data, right? And you see all the methods are very much the same. Um, but by the and so there's no green bar here. There's no session level data. But by the third uh, session in a query, you're actually better off by a little bit here and using only session data. Okay, so you, can, you need to switch throughout the course of a session from using whatever. You need to learn what information to use when. Um, okay, so the, now, there's an interesting thing in, in this model when, you're, when you do this, even this combination of when your current need is either similar to or different than your long-term interest. So here's a person. It's a fictitious person. Um, and this is the distribution of topics in their model of interaction over a long period of time. Okay. So, sort of a sports junkie. Um, if you see another session, is that consistent with that model or not? So that's a typical session. Um, you might see another session from this person that has dentist root canal, dental implant, dental implant recovery. Something has happened in their life. <laughs> And there's an acute information need which is different than their long-standing interests. And it turns out that about 6% of search sessions are atypical like this, if you look at the topical distribution of people's queries. Uh, the most common topics when you have an acute information need that deviates from what you do typically is medical stuff and, interestingly, computer troubleshooting. <laughs> there's a lot of things that go wrong with our fancy technologies. Um, these kinds of sessions also tend to be more complex and have per poorer quality search results to begin with. And so personalization can really help here. And you, you can think of these atypical sessions as doing what you need to do versus doing what you want to do. And again, personalization um, is really, really helpful when, when you can do this. Um, okay, so we, and here's just the, the results of this work. If you look at session level data only, you do really well for atypical sessions. You sort of are OK for um, typical sessions. If you use historic-only data, you're really good if it's aligned with your, your um, pre previous history and not so well if it's not. And if you use a hybrid that tries to learn based on the current query, how to weight it relative to these two models of your interests, you do much better. Um, so it, all three of these. 
examples have illustrated, I think, how you can build an understanding of what people are interested in, sometimes very simple things like exact memorization, sometimes much richer models. But you need to take into account a variety of changes over time, the consistency of sessions uh, relative to each other. I want to pop to something that I think you mentioned about using um, metadata about where people are, when, uh, what they've been doing, and their relationship to, to others. So it turns out that queries are not uniformly distributed over time. You can see two sets of queries, and a lot of models assume they are. You can see Dancing with the Stars has a weekly periodicity. Uh, tax extensions is starting to ramp up now. And after April 15th, it'll drop off a, a, you know, a cliff. And what we need to do again, and what's, so like who cares, right? If the results are the same, regardless of when the query is issued, it doesn't matter. But it turns out that what's relevant to a query depends on when it is. So if I type in the query US Open, what do I want to get? Well, in 2020, it's different than 2019, first of all. <laughs> if I type in US Open 2020, do I want golf or tennis? It turns out that that varies a lot by the month it is. It's a pretty good predictor of which of those you want. Imagine I type in US ten Tennis Open 2020, very clear. But here again, it matters. If you're just before the event, what people want is the schedule, the time of the events. They want to buy tickets. During the event, what people want is real-time scores, right? where to see the, a live broadcast. After the event, they might want general sites and, and recaps. So this is a case where the intent is really clear. But where you are relative to an event matters. And so again, search engines need to deal with all of these dynamics of both the content that's available, the queries that people issue. And most, what's most challenging is that what's relevant changes over time. Um, okay, so we, we built a variety of change aware um, retrieval models. I'm not going to say very much about these except to say, that we consider two factors in building retrieval models that have a notion of temporal dependency in what's relevant. One of them actually looks at changes in words that occur on a page over time, because that can give you an issue of what's uh, particularly relevant. Some pages are always, some words are always on a page. So think about uh, the Stanford homepage. Some words are always there. It's Stanford University, it's located in the same place. Others change over time what news feature they may have on the, the item. And the longevity of a word in a page can give you very good estimates of what's relevant at any point in time. And then we also look at these kinds of dynamic user interaction patterns. And if you use these two sources of information, you can develop much better ranking models than, again, if you treat things as uniformly distributed and uh, independent. Okay, I want to talk um, a little bit, not just about uh, Temporal context, but spatial context. Where you're located can help interpret a word. The word football or jumper or chips mean very different things in the US and the UK. Uh, library or zoo or current time can be given at many different levels of resolution, at a city level, a state level. And then there are things like Starbucks or pizza that are at a micro level. If I type in Starbucks now, I don't really want to know about the corporation. I don't want to know about things that are close to where I live in Boston. I want to know about stuff that's relative to me now. And so there are really interesting um, signals about your current location that can provide really um, can, can provide insights about what you're likely to, to be looking at. And so for all this work, what we did is looked at queries, URLs, and inferred locations. And what we want to do is estimate um, a function that looks at the interest that I might have in a particular URL uh, based on my current location. And similarly, the, what the query might mean based on my location. And there's clearly a background model that doesn't take location into account at all. Um, and so here's a picture of this interest model. This, in this case, the query is SMH. Here, the clicked URL is smh.com, which is the Sarasota Memorial Hospital. And people who are in Florida, and maybe a little bit on the East Coast, given that query, click on this result. There's another group of people who click on smh.com.au. They're much more broadly distributed. 
This is the Sydney Morning Herald. And these are probably expats who live in the big population centers. So you can tell, actually, in, in this case, based on where the queries are coming from, what the likely intent is. And not all queries, not all topics, have a location-specific pattern like this. The ones that are most, the, the cases that have many of the most location-centric URLs are things like classified ads, uh, newspapers, local TV, radio, things that are, are reasonably um, specific to a locale. And so again, by modeling this notion of the spatial distribution of what it is that people click on given the same query, um, and this is done by combining a variety of Gaussians um, that, that depend on the resolution at which you want to mod uh, model location, you can do a much better job of satisfying people's needs. Uh, what is this about? Uh, right. Okay, so th this just talks about the details of the, the ranking. It turns out that the most important features in improving search for given location information is the original ranking, not surprisingly. The probability that the URL is clicked on by others in this location. And the divergence of the KL divergence of the model, the location model for the particular URL versus a global model. Um, and here's, here's just an example, again, of RTA bus schedule. And you can see that there are pockets. There's a pocket here. It refers to Riverside, California. There's a pocket here um, around Ohio. And it's really just the Cleveland, Ohio uh, rapid, what's it called, the Rapid Transit Authority or something, the Regional Transit Authority. And there's another one, another Regional tran trans Transit Authority down in, in New Orleans. And so given this same query, you can have very different geographic um, pointers to what might be the relevant URL. OK, I am going to, I guess this is the last example. Let me try to go through this. Um, so one of the, the challenges in doing personalization is that you need to get input from individuals about what's relevant to them. You can do it explicitly. It's a real pain. Uh, how many of you have done these inline surveys and webs uh, in any kind of system? It disrupts your flow. It's, uh, it's tedious. People just want to uh, dismiss the, the item. You can look at explicit, implicit data, interaction data. Um, but that is noisy. It's plentiful, but very noisy. What we wanted to do to, was to see if we could get crowd workers to give us personalized judgments. And so we tried two different ways of, of doing this. One is what we call grokking. So I'm going to give you some summary of a person, and I want you to understand what that person might want. In the other case, I'm not going to tell you anything about this particular person, but what I will do is match your behavioral interactions with these people. So here's an example. Um, yeah, okay, we did several studies. Okay, so here's, uh, I'm going to ask you to grok this person. I'm going to give you, what do you think the rating is? One or four? How would the person like that lovely little salt shaker pair on the right? How many people say one? One or two? Three or four? Okay. So in just like 30 seconds, I, you have a pretty good understanding of what this person wants, albeit in a very simple part of their life. Uh, the other thing you can do is just look at people who've rated these or interacted with these and find the people who are most like me and use their predictions. This is standard collaborative filtering. Okay? And so we tried this. We had people uh, try to predict others' preferences for salt shakers and food in a couple of different cities. Grokking, showing you an example of what the person's behavior is to date, um, works very well for uh, capturing simple preferences. Pe the, the Turkers love this task. Uh, and it requires very few workers. And so you get all of these, in either of these methods, you get big advantages over not doing um, any kind of personalization. Matching requires many more workers. Uh, it's actually very easy to do, and the, the data is, is reusable. So depending on the nature of the task, the complexity of the preference spaces, you can use one or the other of these methods to understand how you can personalize what, what people want, even if, um, uh, even if you don't require long histories of interaction from them 
or explicit judgments. And so I think crowdsourcing is promising in, in domains where the lack of prior data uh, can limit performance of more traditional methods. There are also you know, big questions about uh, privacy in, in doing this. OK, so I want to spend the last, uh, let me spend five or 10 minutes on this in talking about challenges or opportunities. And then I'll, I'll open it up to, uh, to questions. So there are a whole host of challenges in, in personalizing systems. I've alluded to some of them. Some of them are very uh, person-centric. They have to do with privacy. They have to do with concern about serendipity and, and filter bubbles. They, uh, there are concerns about transparency. You type in the same query twice in a row, and you get different results. What the heck's going on? Um, and then there are a bunch of system-level things. So uh, folks are interested in system-level challenges. It, Personalization is a real problem. I mean, most web services work by caching results. If I have a common query and different people mean different things by it, I can't cache those results. So all the caching that you typically do is busted. Uh, now, there are ways to get around that. You can cache a larger number of results and do re-ranking of a fixed set of, of results. But there are some, some big uh, system issues. And I'll mention evaluation again at the end. So um, you know, privacy is, is challenging. The, fundamentally, the query and the results, the, the, sorry, the query and the model need to live in the same place. And so it can, that model uh, in, in personalized search example that I showed you, uh, it was private. Everything lived on the client. Only the query was sent to a server. That's fabulous in terms of, of privacy, but lacks in terms of the breadth of uh, the, the broad utilization of those models. It's device specific. It's um, uh, there's no community learning. It's actually quite inefficient in a number of ways. There are cloud profiles. And uh, for example, web search, any other modern web app. Uh, and the, the challenge here is I think that all service providers need to be transparent about what they're saving and provide control over what's saved and, and removing some of the, that information. And I think a lot of web services are, are moving in that direction. There are other approaches. Like more and more, there are public or semi-public models of an individual. Um, you can use lightweight profiles. For example, only queries that occur over the last k minutes or within a current session and then disappear after that. You can match to a group or, or a cohort that are similar to me in a number of dimensions. And so uh, we, in practice, explore not so much the local stuff, but um, you know, how we can provide transparency and control and a variety of other pro approaches that are um, lighter weight and might aggregate over more and more people. It's also an, an interesting question about personalization and serendipity. You hear this a lot. Um, so it doesn't mean the end of serendipity. And, and we have some results that suggest that it can actually increase um, serendipity. So we did an experiment in which we looked at relevance versus interestingness. So for any search result, we asked people to say, is this relevant to your query? Or is it interesting to your query? Now, personalization, not surprisingly, finds more relevant results. That's what you'd hope. It also found more interesting results. And even when the, results were, the interesting results were not relevant. And I think the reason for this is when people talk about serendipity, they don't want random things. They want things that are related and grounded in something about what they already learn and, and do and, and push out in interesting directions. And so that's why personalization helped, I think, in spite of the fact that the results might, have been, not, might not have been relevant. They were grounded in something about the individual, provided ways to expand in ways that were not completely random. Um, and so like the princes of serendip in the old fable, you need to be ready for serendipity. And I think personalization um, actually provides kind of guardrails about not going too far off things that, that are relevant and interesting. Um, and I want to end by talking a little bit about evaluation. I mean, in all of these systems, whenever you build a system, Michael and I were just talking about this uh, earlier, you need to be able to evaluate to know whether you're making progress. Uh, web search, in retrospect, is perhaps the easiest place to look at success. People stop everything they're doing, they issue a query, they tell you what they're looking for, and by and large, they click something that's relevant or satisfies that need within a short period of time. Um, we were how do you know if you're successful if you're doing something 
um, what, what was the example that you gave, uh, Michael, earlier? It was at uh, Instagram. How do, you, how do you know if you're, how do you know if that's good? Is it time spent? Is it uh, repeat visits? It, how do you know if you're writing you know, a system like Word or PowerPoint, whether your changes have made a difference? Do you want to measure how long I spent, how quickly I leave? Which of those is relevant? And so you need to think hard about um, what's relevant and how you measure those changes. So uh, in search, again, we have it kind of easy. You have two ways of measuring what's relevant to an individual. You can ask external people to make judgments. Right? When you have external judges tell you whether a URL is relevant to a query, that's fine. It's a reasonable place to start. But it lacks the diversity of intents that different people have. It lacks the realistic context. You know, SMH, how are you going to judge whether these sites are relevant unless you know what that means? Um, and you know, crowdsourcing can help a little bit here, provide a broader diversity of perspectives. You can actually have the actual person who's interested in something be the judge. You can do that um, either through explicit judgments or implicit behaviors. Um, what's nice about this method is that it allows you to explore a variety of alternatives in a very safe way if you do it offline. If you do it online, where you're actually deploying the system in the wild, you need to be um, you know, very careful about what you deploy. And so explicit judgments here are very nice in that they're really precise, they're contextual, but they're really annoying. <laughs> Implicit judgments are scalable, they're natural, but again, there's a lot of noise. I click on something and then I move back. What does that mean? Does that mean I was interested, that it satisfied my needs immediately? Uh, there are a whole set of, uh, I can give a whole other talk on complementing behavioral logs with other measures to really understand what's behind people's queries, whether they're satisfied or dismayed and so on. Um, and really one way to, uh, one of the things we spend a lot of time doing is trying to bridge the gap between what happens offline, what you can get from log data, and what happens online when you actually deploy a system because there is a larger gap than one would like if you look just retrospectively at old data or at newer data. So let me just summarize, and then I'll, I'll, I have, I think, 10 minutes or so for questions. So I think that the main thing I was trying to get across today is that queries are really difficult. Even something as simple as a search query is really difficult to understand in isolation. Um, augmenting that query with information about who's asking, when it is, where they are, what other things they've interacted with, what tasks they might be doing, pro provides a much uh, better search results. I mean, we, we saw that it can improve search quality up to 70% of the time. There's a large uh, potential for improving search and personalization. I've given you different examples that look at largely content, both short-term, long-term, look at spatiotemporal context, and a little bit at using crowd work to provide some interesting insights. There are a bunch of challenges, um, and I've tried to highlight how we think about some of those. But I think the, um, maybe the, the main takeaway from, from this is that personalization and, and contextualization is increasingly important today in our info, information-rich environments. Uh, it's increasingly so in mobile and proactive retrieval settings. I think that we as HCI researchers uh, should lead the charge toward improving the quality of experiences, but doing it in a way that respe uh, excuse me, respects privacy and, and a variety of other things that, that matter. So with that, I'll stop. I want to thank a ton of collaborators. And I have, I think, uh, five or six minutes now for, for questions. So thanks. Somebody's up there. <laughs> yeah, you just, I, I'll, I can talk to you later. Um, I'm really interested in how search uh, researchers and engines are thinking about uh -huh. the trustworthiness of the result versus personalization. If you have somebody yeah. who always goes to Fox News and you show them a New York Times headline and they're like, oh, Google has a liberal bias. I mean, it feels like a quagmire. Um, yeah, they're. they're You've asked a, a couple of questions in there. So one is trustworthiness, and that's incredibly hard. I think uh, whether it's web search or email spam or a whole host of other things, 
frankly, these are adversarial situations. There's money to be made by moving your result or somebody else's result to the top position. And uh, the search industry spends a lot of time trying to combat that. I think, uh, you know, in terms of, of fake news, people try, but it's an, uh, it's an arms race. I think what we can do is educate people a little bit about the characteristics that uh, some trustworthy pages have. And the algorithms are really getting better at, um, you know, at, at understanding what makes for trustworthy pages. They can be all sorts of things like the narrative in the story. So a lot of untrustworthy pages don't have all the details that you'd expect. Um, they come from, you are from hosts that come and go rapidly. So there are a number of signals you can use, but it's still a, a challenge. The other one that you asked is, is really um, much more about preferences. And uh, this is especially true in, in most cases. One of the things that web search engines do do is try to diversify the results that come to provide different perspectives. Bing actually has something called perspectives. And you can see for certain queries, both pros and cons. You can see information from different sources. And so I think people are trying to provide some uh, you know, diversification of the, of the search results. But in, in studies that, that social media platforms have done, um, there really is a question of you can diversify, but if people continue to select, something that aligns with their preferences or, or interests. Um, you know, there's not much you can do as a, a provider. You can remove those sites, and they'll just they'll go elsewhere. So I don't know if that answers it. But there were at least two different questions, I, I think, in that. Yeah, Mike. Maybe riffing on that question, you know, search engines, at some point, I guess, in the, in the aughts, like, they were, the there was aughts. a lot of focus. so long ago. Yeah, well, OK, a decade ago. <laughs> there was a lot of focus on how they could be manipulated, yeah. whether there was, you know, miserable failure pointing to George Bush, all these things yeah. that like in some ways are reoccurring now in the space of social media, yeah. uh, disinformation yeah. and, and these kinds of things. Yeah. And I wonder if you know, your experiences in search give you perspectives or advice. Like what advice would you give to you know the 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 newer platforms about it? What you've learned through these processes about how yeah, well, I mean, I can tell you horror stories about uh, you know spam in in web search, right? It, it first started out with very simple things, like people would actually modify the page in ways that were invisible to people. So you could add all these spammy keywords in minuscule font or in the same color as the background. Uh, when that was detected and put down, then people started spamming links. Right? You'd have link farms pop up. It's lucrative enough that your, your link farm can disappear in a month. And people are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. So they'll shut it down and move to the garage next door. Uh, there's behavioral spam. Companies will spam each other's ads by clicking through with bots. Uh, and that's reasonably easy to detect, because it used to be that a lot of the behavioral spam would occur at 12.01. 1202, 1203. And so now people have put on distributions that mirror human response time. And so there's this ongoing effort to, uh, to do it. In the case, I think, of you know, some of the social media sites, people need to look at a variety of signals that you have. It's not just the content. It's where it's coming from, what the link structure looks like, how people are interacting with it. Um, and it's, you know, it takes a, a while to identify those features, to identify places that, that really stand out, and to try to uh, mitigated. I don't think there's a particularly quick answer and in to the, that. In the case of there was you know, debates about how act, proactive the search engine should be in yeah. you know, moderating some of these behaviors that are maybe more in the gray areas than yeah. like, yeah, this person's just clearly spamming. Yeah. Um, and yeah, now they, I think those are reoccurring. Do you feel like you know, do you feel like there are lessons to be learned there as well? I mean, there's a you know, there's a spectrum. I mean, there's there's stuff I think that everybody would agree is a clear spam. There's others. Uh, even just think about it in email spam. If I happen to go to a website, it, is it really spam that they send me information? If I forgot to unclick, I want to unsubscribe. Um, I, I don't. That's a little gray. And I think you see this in in a lot of these um, you know these things. If I rewrite the headline to make it more clickbaity, is that spam? Uh, and so there are cases that I think clearly are. You see these attacks where there's slight variations of the same thing appearing over and over and over again. Uh, from a single site, and there are others that, that are much grayer. And it, it, again, as, as providers of information services, you really need to worry about perpetuating a single point of view versus um, you know, giving people a, a broader sense of um, expression. And I, 
I don't, I don't know that there's a, you know, an easy answer. Wherever there's a market, you can buy elections, right? There's, you know, for 5K, you can buy a local election, for 50K, a presidential or senatorial election. <laughs> Wherever there's a market, there's going to be this adversarial relationship. Um, there are, somebody will win and lose in, in this, and you can pay to be on either side with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in terms of the intent uh, exploration and yeah. you know, all these markers or, say, like, uh, implicit markers, what about making it more explicit? Do you think people might be willing to say that right now I, don't, I want to see something new? I want to yeah, that, explore, um, like, give them more than just a query, maybe a query and a tag or something. That's yeah, yeah that, that's interesting. For what, what people find, I think, particularly annoying is saying this is relevant or not. Um, you might be willing, and I think you see it in, in some systems like Spotify, to say, quick, re no, not this one right now. And that's a very, um, that's an, a very interesting way of, of modifying your, your profile. You might, you see it a lot in, in systems that have faceted metadata. So if you have metadata about pages, you can provide easy guidance for somebody to select, a, like this, but. Um, so you, you see some of that. Uh, I think with web search results, you don't see as much of it, partly because it's not entirely clear what metadata is particularly um, relevant. In shopping sites, it's very clear, right? It's size, price, all sorts of other things. OK, I have two seconds. Two. <laughs> OK, we're over. Okay. <laughs> so I'm happy, to, I'm happy to stick around and answer other questions. <laughs>